<clears throat> right as I was leaving of, of implementing some type of CMS system. And so I think it's important, uh, it's a good way to manage your website, to be able to focus on more of the, the function that you can add to your website, the graphical enhancements to your website, and not have to worry about uh, upkeeping the content. Today we're going to have three speakers. Uh, Michael Monina is the director of sales for Omni Update, which is a, a CMS geared towards the higher education market. And I know that it is used by at least one law school, John Marshall Law School, as well as a number of other educational institutions. We'll then have Ian Barksdale from Northern Kentucky University speaking and talking about Macromedia's web publishing system. And then Ben Chapman, the Assistant Dean for Information Technology from Emory. And he'll be discussing uh, Typo 3, which is an open source CMS. So that's the end of my two minutes of presentation. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Michael from Omni Update. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for everyone being here. CMS gets tossed around a lot, and uh, we've got course management systems and content management systems and a number of other things like that. I assure you we're talking about content management. And um, one of the things we just want to you know, bring, want you to consider is, um, according to Google anyway, um, there's about 8 billion web pages on the, on the World Wide Web. About 50 million websites. It probably comes as no surprise to most of you. Uh, so roughly about less than 200 pages per site. Well, quite a different story for most uh, educational sites. About 80 million web pages, about 7,000 institutions, so it comes out to roughly about 11,000 pages per site. So you probably are all pretty familiar with that. It's part of the reason why we're here talking about content management. Mm -hmm. um, an important reason why institutions look at content management is just because of the fact that their website is so important. It's become uh, the gateway to you know, all these different constituents, all the people that, that come to a university website or a, a college uh, website, all the different reasons that they, they come to that site. There's just a lot of different constituents, a lot of different types of sites. You've got faculty sites, you've got the main campus site, you've got departmental sites, so very diverse environment. And this is just a uh, part of just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the benefits, why is it important? It's really important that the site be, of course, effective, be current and up to date, uh, be easy to navigate, um, have a, a consistent look and feel. And these are you know, a lot of the reasons why institutions look for our content management system. A lot of times when we're called in, um, you know, the opposite <coughs> is true. We're seeing pages that are you know, that have been developed over the last 10, 10 or so years, that have had, you know, been developed by countless different uh, uh, people that have come and gone, students that have been there, and different designs for different departments. And at some point, some, somebody within the uh, structure says, hey, we need to get control of this. Um, the, the, the benefits are obvious to all these different, these different groups. Okay, so the need for a tool. And there's a lot of different tools you're going to hear from, from different uh, strategies of the other speakers. Um, there, there's definitely a need for a tool to, to make this process more effective. 
Uh, not everyone wants to be a web design person. I don't think anyone in this, everyone in this room wants to be that. Not everybody wants to hand code HTML or, or FTP or XHTML or even know how to spell that stuff. So basically, there's got to be a tool that allows people to, to do this more effectively. Uh, that's where a content management system comes in. Also, gone are the days where you can rely on a, a student or a faculty member that volunteered for this, or, or you know, a webmaster, or someone who says, you know, I'll take over, you know, I'll, I'll be the person, the main contact for the, the website. It, it's, it's just too, you know, it's too big now, it's, it's too important. Um, those days are, are really gone. <coughs> also, there's, uh, as this slide represents, uh, really a, a perfect storm of, of convergence of things that are going on between new technologies, new demands, new, higher expectations for websites, people, whether you like it or not. Um, compare your, your, your institution's website to the best websites that are out there, the, the people that matter most to you. You know, the, the students and prospective students are comparing your, your site to, you know, Amazon and to eBay and to, you know, sites that, you know, millions and millions of dollars have been spent developing. And, you know, you, you have to compete. You have to be able to uh, you know, keep up. Um, and there's just, as I said earlier, a mountain of content. University sites just have, and, and educational sites in general have a mountain of content and, you know, just a, a lot of reasons for that. Let's define web content management and what it is. There, there's a lot going on. Um, basically, it's a solution to distribute the process of publishing content to a website. Um, we specialize, as I said, in web content management. Uh, we, we, our, our roots are not in, in document management. I mean, basically, we, we developed the system with web content in mind. We developed it with the fact that we know that there's a very diverse environment in educational uh, institutions between you know, technology and, and servers and clients and different levels of, of, uh, of user and user experience. So we really developed uh, on the update with that in mind. Okay, what are the choices? The choices are the ever popular status quo, let's not do anything, and that's uh, something that we fight with all the time. Um, homegrown solutions, uh, high-end corporate solutions that are usually not even close to affordable for most educational institutions, um, and then solutions for higher education. I'm going to look at the status quo one in a little bit more detail because I love that. <laughs> First step, introduce yourself to the webmaster. Good, good strategy, you know, face to face, you know the person, you know, you may be able to get something done that way. Then, you know, maybe email the webmaster. Tell them something like, hey, you know, I need to get this piece of content put up. You know, when you have a chance, if you could do it, that would be great. Maybe chat. Face to face is probably a better idea. You know, you want to chat with the person. And then hunt them down is a good one. You know, go find them and or her. And, you know, usually the cafeteria or someplace like that. Is good. <laughs> and then plead and beg with the webmaster. This is the squeaky wheel syndrome. You all are familiar with it, obviously. And these are, you know, real, sometimes effective ways that they kind of get old pretty fast. Um, okay. How much in universities are experiences that the, the sites are different? Um, than what uh, a, a corporate environment is. You know, the, the cookie cutter approach um, of, of content management systems, of having a, a certain type of solution, whether it's database driven or, or you know, um, it, it's just typically too expensive, too long of an implementation time. It requires a complete migration of, you know, sometimes tens of thousands of pages um, to this database structure. And a lot of times it's just, I talked with um, someone who was evaluating solutions. And uh, they were like, well, we need to get this you know, implemented soon, like within 30 days. And you know, we're talking about you know, a year implementation if we, if we do this, you know, this other solution that we were looking at. It was a solution that started with MS. I forget what it's started for, but it was some, some other software company. Um, so so um, as I said, ed education, very diverse environment. Uh, a lot of different types of, of websites. We, you know, there are uh, solutions out there that cater specifically to um, you know the different types of websites. We have solutions for uh, the public website. We have solutions for faculty um, because basically faculty. We're going to assume a different set of rules for a faculty member that's updating their own web pages. We 
We understand that there's academic freedom. We understand that the faculty is going to have, the faculty member is going to have the autonomy to be able to publish to their own site, whatever they want. What we want to do is put some curbs in the road for the faculty member to be able to make sure that they're not using a pink background and purple text and, you know, some outdated um, um, logo of the, of the institution. So we want to be able to provide them with uh, the tools of, of a, a template design, but still give them the, the ability to edit the entire page to publish whenever they want to publish, no approval process on the faculty uh, system. This is different than what we have for the, the public website. I'm just bringing this up because the, the, the different types of solutions are important to the, that, that relate to the, the different types of websites that you find in an in educational environment. Okay, essential features of, of, of any content management system is in education, it needs to be flexible. It needs to be able to um, work with a number of different technologies, a number of different servers, and like I said, just very flexible in how the structure is, the structure of the website. We don't um, enforce a specific type of architecture. Um, our solution is very um, um, open standard based. Uh, we work with a lot of uh, institutions that work with um, CSS and with uh, server side includes, and we fully support those types of standards. So we don't come in and say, okay, this is the way your website needs to look. This is the architecture that you need to, uh, to you know, uh, put in place in order for uh, on the update to work. Uh, the opposite is true. What we do is, is uh, mirror what you already have or what you're planning to have and work with the, the uh, web design people and the, the IT people um, to, to make sure that on the update fits in with what you're doing. Scalability is important. We've got um, institutions that we work with that uh, have very few content contributors that, that touch the site, anything from five or ten or, or just one department. We're not an all or nothing solution. It doesn't require that you know you have to scrap everything that you're doing and, and move everything into on the update. Uh, we've got uh, institutions that uh, just the library, for example, Cal State Long Beach uh, is a good example where the library is using the, the uh, on the update solution. And um, I'm proud to say, but none of the, the rest of the institution isn't yet. We're working on it. Um, price to fit, that's really important. I mean, you know, there are solutions out there that are, you know, six figures and up, and, uh, you know, interwoven and vignette, terrific, great, you know, but nobody, you know, very few educational uh, institutions can afford it. Um, browser based, we're a strong believer in having the solution be browser based. Um, our solution happens to be cross platform because you see that. Uh, uh, in the education environment, you're going to have people using you know, all kinds of different uh, browsers, different uh, platforms, so you want to be able to support all those things. Uh, obviously, multi-user. And ease of use, I put down at the bottom there, it's really very important. If you have uh, technology that you implement that isn't easy to use and can't be um, um, you know, trained, you can't train people how to use it in, with, with our system, we, we um, get feedback from our customers that you can usually train someone how to use it in about an hour. Um, if it's not easy to use, and then people aren't going to use it. And the return on investment on your, on your implementation is going to be zero. As I said, uh, usability is key, um, and, and it can be the, the killer too. I mean, if, if you roll it out and, and it's, it's just not usable, then, and then people are just going to uh, uh, work against you. Um, yeah, the education environment is another thing. You can't force technology down someone's throat. You know, it's the way our approach, what we do is it's something that allows, that, like I said, it's not an all or nothing solution. Um, it can be very targeted to specific departments or to you know, specific people. But if you have somebody that says, hey, I want to use Dreamweaver and I want to hand code, you know, go ahead. You know, you have, it, that's, there's no problem. Okay. Uh, the right tool is going to distribute the web publishing process and, and, and do what Eric said, you know, make that uh, process easier for people to do and, and distribute that to the people that really have the, the content, that are the content experts, that, that know what they want to put up on the web. Um, it is going to help maintain that consistent design through the use of templates, through the use of CSS, and separating out the, the content from the design, which is a very important aspect of, of, uh, of content management systems in general. Um, to help ensure ADA 508 compliance. Everybody knows what that is. Everybody, did anybody go to the session earlier today? Um, this is for America, Americans with Disability Act and, and uh, content management systems really go a long way to, to help ensure that, that websites are in compliance. According to the, the uh, session I went to earlier, I think the uh, gentleman said only four law schools out of 180 that he had tested. Four law libraries. Law libraries out of 180 were 
Um, that, I'm sorry, that wasn't even compliant. That was just, that was just a, that, that could validate um, compliance. Said that none of them were compliant, were 508 compliant. Um, it also frees up the IT people. IT people, you know, don't like making these, you know, getting, you know, stopped in the hallway to, to make updates. So it frees them up to do other things, other more important things, and hopefully keeps them in control. Um, all right, if it's the right, thing, the right solution, it's going to empower content authors, it's going to keep content fresh, all those types of things. Um, education is, you know, when I talk to people throughout the country, you know, one of the first things they say is, look, we don't have a lot of money. Well, I'm like, you know, first thing I say is, you're not alone. I mean, nobody, there are very few, I mean, we deal with Dartmouth. I mean, Dartmouth probably has a lot of money, but they still don't have a lot of money budgeted towards, you know, this type of solution. <laughs> um, this is my slide of uh, experience counseling. So it's just some of the, the schools that we're dealing with. Uh, John Marshall Law School is, is one of them, University of Chicago, Dartmouth, Pepperdine, I mentioned. Um, the thing that ties these schools together is that they had a problem, they went through a process of evaluating solutions, and um, they, they picked on the update for a number of different reasons, but um, you know, like I said, most of the times it's, it's ease of use and, and the flexibility. Oh, uh, I wanted to mention one of the things that, that allows us to, to really um, continue to develop on the update as a, as a solution for education is that we are typically very closely involved with our clients as far as getting feedback from them. Uh, we, we consider them partners in development. Uh, one of the things that we're working on now is our assess feeds and being able to, to support that. And that's something that's, uh, you know, came to us directly from one of our clients and, and all of our list of, of what we call our, our to-do list, our wish list, our are usually client-based. Just a real quick case study of, of John Marshall Law School. Um, site was developed in the early 90s, as probably most of uh, your sites were. It was initially maintained by a single volunteer, someone who was, a, I believe, a faculty member. Um, after that, a web coordinator was hired and, and brought on to, to take over that task. Uh, the site grew to a few hundred pages. <coughs> and then they got, uh, you know, the typical content bottleneck where they needed to have a, a solution to that. Um, the basic solution was implemented. The key thing here is that a solution was implemented that was designed for e-commerce. And you'll, you'll find that there are a lot of, of uh, content management systems that are designed for other things, for large publishers, for e-commerce, for, you know, not for education. They're typically not going to be a good fit. That was exactly the situation with John Marshall Law School. So they evaluated CMS requirements and... Uh, Implemented on the update campus. Um, okay, well, what have we learned? Educational websites are, are probably the, the longest lasting, longest standing uh, uh, sites on the web. Large amount of content, uh, a real need for cons consistent design. I think um, a lot of the marketing communications people are now uh, bringing up a word that was probably taboo in education, you know, branding. And they're saying, hey, we, we need to you know, make sure that, that our brand is, is consistent, that people under, know our brand, and that needs to be uh, represented on the, on the web. Um, it's re represented in print, usually, you know, always represented in print, but it was, it was kind of lacking on the web. Uh, ease of navigation, you've got so many different people coming to your site. Um, we've got a, a consultant that we work with that, that deals with um, design and has a concept <coughs> called people-oriented design, where they have um, sp specific uh, constituents that come to your site have a place that they can go. Prospective students, current students, faculty. And it's right on the, the, the home page of the site, and you know immediately, okay, if you're a prospective student, that's where you're going to go. So you know, ease of navigation is something that a good content management system is going to help you support. Um, and then, like I said, accessibility requirements are, are expected and uh, something that you need to, if you're not doing now, you, you really need to keep an eye on and, and, and think about. And with that, just one up next. Ian? Yeah, Thanks for your time. Thank you.
Okay. Um, my name is Ian Barksdale. I now work at the Chase College of Law uh, in Northern Kentucky. And basically, I'm going to be talking about small shop uh, web and what we chose, um, which is basically Macromedia web publishing system. We've only got, for our whole campus, is 14,000. And for the school, uh, we just learned we're going to have a cap of about 500 students. So to me, that's small when I hear about other schools out here of like 1,000 students. It just uh, blows my mind. Um, so right now, we're just going to look at uh, the choice. Um, we have a small, medium-sized website. We also have a small number of non-technical users. Not to disparage our secretaries and such, but you know they're used to web browsing, using uh, Word. That's about it. So we were looking for something that had a browser-like interface, something they were familiar with, something that was easy to configure. Um, you see a screenshot later that there's a double-click file for end users for contribute configuration that you, as an administrator, send out to an email. They double-click it. Their whole contribute is set up for exactly what directories they need to do. That's all they have to do. They don't have to be calling you about what are the settings to FTP or LAN up to the, up to the web server. <coughs> Works with static and dynamic pages, um, depending on what you're going to change on each. Um, we do use, we also use a little bit of um, databasing in the back end where we do our own with PHP and MySQL. But most of the content that we do is with people up in admissions and the registrar. And it's our static pages that they have to update little bits and bobs all the time uh, that we're just you just get overwhelmed with, uh, as was mentioned earlier. We're looking for a unified system from one company, so we have one vendor to go to to talk about any problems that we had. We wanted flexible administrative control. Um, we wanted to be scaler. We wanted what we saw low, low, low cost because a lot of, like you mentioned, a lot of the systems out there aren't for smaller systems. And far too expensive and far too complicated. So, familiar editing interface. Um, not, it's browser-like. Uh, it's about as uh, wussy wig as you can get uh, for the most part. Handles the CSS that we throw out um, really well. Um, we really like the simple formatting controls that you can see up at the top. They just use simple familiar icons uh, for this. Page shows up exactly like it's going to show up in one of our little uh, demo pages for development um, that we were using. And it works with Dreamweaver templates. So basically, every page we have at the administrative level is a templated page. And then we determine from that template what areas are editable. And so you can see right here, right in the middle, page content is what this individual can edit, nothing else. We can open up the menu system to the side, and I'll just start the textual menu. And our global menu on the top, we could open up to someone who uh, would be controlling that if something had to be changed around. Um, so it gives us a lot of control. We don't have to worry about, oh, you know, content editor so-and-so managed to screw up the logo, and you know, for two days no one bothered to tell us, and it just said, logo at the top. Uh, really something we didn't want, so we have a lot of control as administrators uh, over this. And for the higher end folk we have, um, Dreamweaver works with Contribute uh, administration as well. So pages get locked out if someone's using them, you check them back in, uh, and it lets you know through email who has a page, who's working on a page at a time. I have a bad tendency to work on pages and not check them back in. Mm -hmm. uh, I get emails from our content editors saying, uh, I can't update this little calendar. Could you please check it back in? I usually do uh, pretty quickly. And has the easy access help down here as well uh, for our non-technical users. And we also have, we're setting this up. We had an issue um, with <coughs> student organizations. Um, I came from a school that the main campus is where we would send them to have their web pages. At Chase, we have them on our part of the server. And I was a little nervous about that. I was like, oh, no, I want them off. Uh, some of our people there said, well, they like it to be on. When we figured out what we would do is we would go ahead and set up this terminal in one of our offices for the student organizations to be able to log on to their web space with their own username. And they would not have a publish button 
on theirs. They would be locked down for review. That would send any changes they made to be reviewed by our webmaster, assuming it was all kosher. Um, then the webmaster would go ahead um, and put it up. Uh, the other good thing is this keeps uh, three roll, we keep it to three rollbacks, but it keeps it to multiple rollbacks. So if you have a problem, you can go and get you know, up to three or I don't know what I haven't pushed the number up to the top uh, level yet, but you know, it's adjustable probably up to only assuming 99. Um, here's some of the ad administration uh, that we like. I uh, like this because it has easy rules uh, settings, which are uh, exceptionally granular. Um, so each person you can, or group of people, you can really focus on the exact directory pretty much down to the pages, depending on how you have your information architecture set up, about what they can edit, what they can see, what they can get to. And we find this is really good because as sites tend to grow like ours do, if you're a Dreamweaver user, you just see this whole row of directories. And then you've got some subdirectories and subdirectories and then a bunch of pages. That just blows the minds of most of these end users. They're just like, oh my god, where do I go? I don't know what this means. Um, so you just focus them on their little page area, and they're real happy. They become very familiar with just their particular zone. Once again, the send connection key is the double-click end user um, configuration file that I mentioned, and just sends it to them via email. Once again, you have full control over publishing, and you just check a box whether you want to allow people to publish files right up or not. Um, this was actually a change that was made with a lot of requests to uh, Macromedia. The initial version of Contribute just published everything right out to your production server. No, no review, just popped it right up there, unless you pointed it to your development server and then you still had a webmaster to synchronize the site. Um, so a lot of people said, no, no, no. We want them to send it to us and then uh, put it up. Uh, so that was a real nice feature. And here's an example of the granular control over folder access, um, where you can add folders, and you know you can really allow people to do just about whatever you want them to do. Um, I can probably do a whole hour on just every single little feature, so I'm really just showing you the ones that we really picked on the system for that we use, uh, that we use a lot of. Because for the most part, we just lock everything else uh, else down to templating and uh, CSS. I know this is probably going to be hard to see. My screenshot didn't work out quite like I was uh, hoping. Um, this is Contribute Publishing Services. This is another key to this. You can actually just use Dreamweaver and Contribute alone. Um, the Contribute Publishing Services is a centralized sort of basically mini server um, where you can uh, set up your users uh, from one spot. And the other good thing about this is right now we have what's called file based because we have issues with our main campus IT. Um, we add them in. There's also an active directory option where you can use AD and pull in users from AD. And then when you go into the roles uh, dialog that I showed you, you can then choose people you know, from your AD. But it's via LDAP and we're having LDAP issues with our, our main campus. So that's going to be a while before we start using that. Uh, this is another reason why we uh, went ahead and paid the extra money um, for uh, this particular piece is for the log tracking. Uh, that's one thing I didn't, you don't have when you're just using Contribute and Dreamweaver together. And I wanted to know what was going on, how much, you know, what kind of changes were happening. And so this activity log is very precise, exact files, the people, the time. Um, if you can get your people to put descriptions of the changes in, in case you might miss something, uh, uh, that's something else here. Shows you any administration that's been going on um, as well, too. Are you allowed to roll back? Roll back? Are the changes somebody made? If you're an administrator, you can go in and roll back changes, yeah. And so can the users. Anyone who directly is responsible for a page and 
above that can go back and roll back to whatever level you set. Another reason we chose this was because of its uh, central low cost. Um, $69 per contribute license. Uh, $79 is the upgrade in order to have the web publishing services um, active with the logging. Um, and $99 per Dreamweaver license. You can actually, depending on what kind of deal your campus has with Macromedia, get this real cheap. Our campus doesn't have a Macromedia plan, unfortunately. When I was at UA, we did, and it was, I can't remember, it was, it was like even cheaper than that to get. I think the contribute, we were down to about $48 per license the way that we could do. So it was really cheap, uh, cheap there. And so I just, now it's more than I just am saving up to find out exactly how many people we're going to need so I can make the biggest possible purchase and get into their zone of uh, purchasing. Um, that's pretty much it. If I talk too fast, well. Is that for contribute? Do you need either contribute or web publishing system? Or is that 79 in addition to the 69? Uh, that's the upgrade price. Okay. Yeah, if you have contribute, then it's seventy nine dollars over what extra. users would want. I'm kind of confused about what web publishing system. So some users can upgrade the web publishing system, and some could use contribute, or some could use Dreamweaver. What? Yeah. What it is? It's the. It's two hundred. I think it's two hundred and twenty nine dollars. Is the straight pies for a seat for when you just use the the WPS? I mean, it is a little confusing. So it's just each user kind of has your, your choice of how advanced they are and what you want to give them to have. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and it's kind of, it's very strange, and I've had other companies that do this where they want you to upgrade, but there's, to upgrade, there's actually no key or licensing to turn on the WPS, really. I've had a, like, 30-day demo going for, is anyone from Macromedia? <laughs> I've had a 30 day demo going for 60 days. I've been waiting for the timeout to say, okay, you, know, you need to upgrade these seats. So, uh, since we're still in testing mode with the WPS, uh, but I will upgrade our people to the, the 229 in the bulk. And then, because I called them, they said, yeah, it'll be cheaper than that if you have more than 10 users uh, using it. But if you don't need to track, if you don't feel you need that precise you know, control so free tracking. Okay. You so can just use users contribute. Like faculty, you could just give them the plain contribute. Yeah, you could just give them a contribute. Okay. Okay. And then, you know, tighten them down. Really, the WPS portion is just for control freaks. Okay. You really want to track, you know, what exactly is happening to every page okay. um, and when. Because I used that um, in UA where I came from just for the library. I gave just contribute to a bunch of our people who did um, calendars and that because I thought I don't care exactly what's happening you know, to each individual page. And it worked great that way as well. A quick question, where are your files sitting? What kind of server? Um, well, we have two different servers. We have a development server that's actually a Windows machine um, running Apache, um, my PHP, PHP and SQL. But the machine that is our production server that the university has, that's a total Unix box. mentioned 
is a reasonable way of getting information out to our core audiences. And this is often a pretty disparate group of people, and we have to do it via the web increasingly because print budgets, among other reasons, print budgets are, are tight, and printed materials are very expensive, and they're also very dated. Um, so we embarked on a, a web redesign project. Okay, all right, so then you're saying to yourself, I would use that annoying flag. I will just stop. Um, we embarked on a web redesign project that spanned uh, about 13 months. Uh, we hired out the design, and at the same time that we were uh, contracting out the design, because I did not have that skill set in house, we started looking at the back end and where were we going to go? Where were the pages going to be hosted? We had a very traditional uh, you know, Linux based Apache flat file system. Uh, we were using staging server and FTP via uh, Dreamweaver, uh, which we found to be overkill. Uh, overkill and, and, and really pretty intimidating for our content managers, our users, the administrative assistants, the lowest people on our, in the food chain of, of, uh, of the law school were the ones who were often being asked to update things via Via Dreamweaver, and they just didn't, uh, they didn't often uh, have time to do that, and then other issues came up. Uh, Typo 3 as a solution has been around since 1987. It's on version 3.7, 3.8 now. Uh, we're using version 3.7. Uh, Lamp based, those of you who have seen some of my presentations before, uh, know that I'm kind of a fan of something else. Uh, I have in the past used uh, so with a good bit of success and I'm a huge fan of Python. I love so so it's cool stuff. There are lots of reasons why we didn't go with that solution at Emory. The main one being I want to get out of having the web servers in my building. That means I need to look at what the main university offers us. The main university does not offer us <coughs> Java. The main university offers us a choice of cold fusion or PHP. So what you need to be thinking, or what in my case, what I need to be thinking about if I wanted to move ahead was within the PHP world, where could we go? And I have to say I ruled out commercial solutions kind of uh, automatically. I, I and. Probably, uh, you know, that's that's not, uh, you know, that may not be the best decision. But I was, I knew I was going to be looking at an open source solution, so I headed off to uh, open source CMS uh, dot org and uh, started looking at different solutions. The solutions that we looked at uh, included Drupal. There was a great Drupal presentation yesterday. Uh, we also looked at PHP website and we looked at TYPO3. The reason I was drawn to TYPO3 is because I like insanely complicated systems, and it does everything. It's painful enough to choose a content management system. It's a painful process. Uh, people's feelings get hurt, people get frustrated. You don't want to have to do it every time you change your website. So my goal was let's get more features than we need, if we can, and not have to change as our needs evolve. Typo3 does a lot of the same things you've already seen uh, described. Um, Permission-based, very granular. We were interested in uh, WYSIWYG editing or We were interested in WYSIWYG uh, editing. We were also interested in a component-based CMS. In other words, every page is built up out of various components that are stored in a MySQL database. That means that you can do things like create shortcuts and links to them. So if you've gone to the trouble of creating a content element like this, you don't want to recreate that element or copy that somewhere else. We have about 600 pages in our website within Typo3 currently. Uh, we don't want to have to constantly be copying stuff, so the ability to link to different parts of an individual page was important to us. Uh, 
you don't know why the editor is, is always the danger, of course. One of the other things that was appealing to us about Type 3 was the plug-in architecture for video text editors. Remember, we're migrating people from Dreamweaver. And so as we migrate them from Dreamweaver, the people who are in charge of maintaining the pages really haven't changed. The level of expertise is about the same. We need to provide them with something that's relatively WYSIWYG. I use Linux on my desktop, and I use Firefox as my browser. My webmaster, Jason Knight, without whom we could not have done this. Thank you, Jason. Um, my webmaster uses a Mac and Firefox or Safari. 98% of our users use Internet Explorer 6 running on Windows. We want things to be cross-platform. We want, as the open source world evolves, we want to be able to plug new tools in. One of the nice things that we can do with Typo 3, right now we're using something called HTML Area as our rich text editor. It's a PHP plugin to Typo 3 and to many other products. But if we wanted to switch to FCK Edit or one of the other WYSIWYG editors that are out there, we could do that, or even an ActiveX control if we wanted to go that way and just focus on IE users. It's not like it happened, but we could do it. Within the rich text editor, you want to have some control over what people do. You don't want everything to be purple. You don't want them to be able to insert an H1 heading uh, when they're formatting their text. As administrators, we can control everything on this bar up here, up above. That's also important to us. And what's really important to us is that if they upload a two meg file of the dean's head, you know, picture of the dean that's 2,000 pixels square, behind the scenes, Typo 3 will scale it, make it little, and present a small version uh, for us. And that's really important. My goal is I'm much less concerned about someone making a mistake and publishing something they shouldn't have. Historically, that's not been our problem. Our problem has been stale content, not incorrect content because someone got carried away and, and you know, published an announcement that they were now the dean of the law school. <laughs> Historically, our problem is stale content, so we want them, uh, we want them up there. Um, we don't have, we do want to take some questions, so I'm not going to spend a lot, a lot more time. The presentation will be up. There's, there'll be a bunch of links. But the number one downside to using open source, number one by far, support. There isn't any. Documentation, no. Very little documentation. Um, Typo 3 has a book that's come out. It's in German. <laughs> I'm waiting. You know, we are eagerly awaiting. You know, the English translation, uh, which was promised, was promised uh, in uh, in June, and uh, uh, we're in June, and we haven't seen uh, we haven't seen the English version of it. Um, what you wind up doing then is investing considerable sweat in getting familiar with any open source project. I would say that's true of Drupal, it's true of PHP website, it's true of any of the new variants, any of, any of these projects. You're going to spend much more time than if you bring in a consultant or if you have a huge company um, backing the product. And so you have to decide whether your institution will tolerate that and also whether you are the appropriate person to be involved in that sort of a project. Um, these kinds of things, again, appeal to me. And the end user interface is so nice in comparison to the Dreamweaver, did I FTP it? Did I forget to FTP it? No <laughs> you know, problem that we've had before. Um, evaluation resources, uh, take a look at opensourcecms.com. There are now about 35 open source CMSs. Those are just the ones written in PHP. Remember, we've got a lot of other great languages out there and a lot of other great projects. But Open Source CMS uh, has a list of about 35 projects. Uh, again, I'll have another, uh, I'll, after the conference, the list of links and such will be up. The um, other thing I wanted to mention, I think often when you're adopting a new content management system that's in some ways a proxy for adopting 
a new approach to the way you manage your online communication strategy. But often it's presented as, you know, hey, IT director, pick a new content management system, because I just got back from a conference they were talking about, pick one. One of the things you have to think about is how are you going to redesign your website to take advantage of some of the things that the content management system offers you. And there's some tools out there, just plain old paper books, that are very helpful in that process. These are not unique to the CMS process, but there's a book by uh, Emily, uh, I never know how to pronounce her last name, Goto or Goto. Uh, it's called uh, Web Redesign Workflow That Works. It's a wonderful book. Don't undertake any web redesign project without looking at, at this book, Web Redesign by Kelly Goto. Um, the other thing that uh, we found very helpful, so helpful that my 13 committee members stole all my copies of this book, is a book called Don't Make Me Think. It's been out for years. Most of you have probably seen it. If you haven't already looked at it, by Steve Krug. And it's a wonderful book. None of the copies we lent out came back. I don't know where they went. Um, we launched our new site February the 1st. We're pleased with it. Where have we really come up short? Accessibility. I went to this wonderful session on accessibility uh, earlier today. We, we really need to do a whole lot more work in that area. That does not really depend on the back end engine that you use. I want to say just a real quick thing about this. If, if the next time you do a design project and you're contracting out the design project, it is guaranteed that your design firm will tell you that they are standards compliant and that they get CSS. That is a guarantee. You will not get a submission or in response to an RP anymore that doesn't include that. Ask them what their design process is. If their design process starts with Photoshop, you're in trouble. Okay, it, the, it needs to, the next time we contract, we won't use a firm that works that way. They need to start with HTML and work backwards, or start with XHTML, or start with XML, whatever we happen to be using at that point in time. One other, other just real quick thought. Whatever CMS you wind up choosing, take a look at how the data is stored in the database for two years from now, when you're going to pull it all back out. Now, if you're a standards-oriented person, you're hoping that all that data is in XML, because hopefully you've got, looking for our XSLT guru, hopefully you're, you're fortunate to have somebody like, like the folks at Cornell do, who can uh, manage all that XML data. <coughs> Uh, in Typo 3, there was another compromise there, and this reflects the age of the product. It's, the data is stored in the database as a very simplified uh, HTML, okay? And that's a compromise, that's a trade-off. You're gonna have to think about, okay, when I dump, you know, 620 megs of content back out in a year and a half, because we've got a new great thing that we're gonna try out. We're gonna move it all into Zoe. Uh, how am I going to transform all that content so that I can use it the next time? Those are just some thoughts. There'll be some more resources up on the web later. And we've got five minutes for questions for any of them. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I've taken a look at Tempo 3 and I find their templating language and accessibility. I really didn't like it. I just wondered if you had any trouble getting up, getting up to the, you know, you don't really the type of script is actually not a scripting language. So, uh, it is a variable substitution language that exposes some functions that help you later on. You almost have to do no type of script coding anymore. If I had if I were doing an hour presentation, I'd show you the WYSIWYG tools that what you do is you start out with an HTML design, and then it highlights the ID and class elements in your, in your design. You click on them and say, this will be replaced by this kind of content. And it seems to work very well. So I haven't looked at it for almost two years, so it's kind of interesting. There have been enormous changes, uh, just enormous changes. I'm not trying to sell anyone on Typo 3, by the way. I like it very much, but I'm a massive. Um, I just wanted to comment real quickly on something that Michael Morena said. 
I'm the webmaster from the John Marshall Law School, and um, I think that, um, well, we, when we were looking at content management systems, the first thing that we did was narrow it down based on price, and then um, based on uh, the demos that we had from the different companies. And um, But the most important thing that we did was to, after we narrowed it down to three, was to allow our, our users, our future users, to evaluate each product. And um, what happened was they did find out the update and most user friendly, and that's why we chose that one. So I would encourage anyone who's thinking about a content management system, not just to look at it from the IT point of view, but also how your users will um, take to it, and that also will make your job easier. And um, the second thing I want to say is, in defense of all webmasters anywhere, we don't spend very much time slacking off in the cafeteria. Who <laughs> <laughs> said that? Yeah, back there, in the back. Yeah, we have a site that doesn't use content management at all. Taking our existing design as it is unchanged, plugging it into a content management system. Maybe Michael can uh, comment on that because that was a question that I had for him a year and a half ago when I talked to him about this product. Yeah, with, with us, very few, um, because like I said, that's what the product is designed to do. Um, the only thing that you would want to do to the, the pages, if they're, you know, HTML pages, is put in some comment code um, to create those editable regions that, that Ian talked about, you know, where you can have, uh, um, you know, an editable region of, of just the body section so you can protect the design from, you know, the, the, um, the you know, the content. Um, we can do that with our, with our system, we can do that on pages completely static um, and, and put those comment codes into that page. Um, or you can have a page that has dynamic elements, that has Flash and has JavaScript and all this other stuff that you don't want people to be able to edit in the WYSIWYG editor and, and make an editable area of that. So those comment tags can be put in with the grep or you know, global client replace or you know, we do that as part of the implementation process. So you know, depending on you know, how many of those pages you want to do, we can, we can do that. Yes. What kind of cost was it for Joe and Marshall? I think it was, um, well, I think that some of them go up to like $200,000, $100,000. Yeah, the, well, cost, the cost for us is based on the number of users, um, you know, and, and the user level. Our, our, our minimum cost is $7,500 for 25 users, and then the cost per user goes down as it scales. So our, our basic, um, um, you know, price range is anywhere in the, Fifteen to you know, thirty thousand dollars. Do you remember what I was with? Uh, no. And we did a multi-year deal, so it was you know it it, 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 it depends on the number of users you have. I, I have that information to be happy to provide to you. That's so, per year. Um, well, we do a hosted application, so it's um, you know, we typically do it as a hosted application, and that that is the annual cost. There's no. Um, you know, additional you know hosting or anything else. We when we say host uh, host application, we're hosting just the, the the tool itself, just the application, the site. Your site stays hosted where it is. We target that through FTP or SFTP, and yeah, that is an annual cost. You can deploy on the update as a as a, a an appliance, and you can do a, a you know a license where it's just a, um, a you know a one time thing, but then you know no updates or anything like that, no upgrades.
Yeah, I, gotta, I just wanted to make a comment. I got another question, but we, we went with a system called Serena Collage, and my recommendation to any of you, if you see anyone from this company come run and hide. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I can wrap up our experience with that product that way. And, and don't think it up. I don't think that uh, you can, don't, don't delusion yourself into thinking that you can hire a consultant and who can tell you what to do and hire a, a product with quote unquote support that, that uh, is going to automatically do anything and you're not going to have to write any code or you're not going to have to sweat up. Now, maybe we just chose the wrong vendor and had a bad experience and maybe we have some better system too that we get to talking about, but I, I don't think that there's a turnkey solution to much of this. Could be wrong, but I get to see it. Um, I, we have a lot of people that are kind of addicted to Word. I don't know if other people have issues, but it just really isn't useful to have use Word as a content, a web content authoring tool. It really is very awful. And so we have a couple browser-based solutions here in the desktop client uh, contributed to one. And, and I'm just wondering if the other, just open it up to everybody, you have had an issue and how do you weed people on a word into it some other environment? I, uh, just a, a quick comment on that. That is a challenge because constantly um, people will cut and paste. I mean, you know, they, they actually, even though you've provided a WYSIWYG mm -hmm. editor, the window, although it can be maximized, it can be increased, they're just more comfortable doing the bulk of their editing in Word. Then they highlight the whole thing, they paste it in. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I like about um, the WYSIWYG editors, they're basically JavaScript, they're all written in JavaScript, the plugin editors, is they have word cleaning, uh, word cleaning built in. And so it will get rid of a whole lot of what's being pasted in. What they often don't catch, if you're a standards geek, there are entity problems with some of the, um, depending on how fancy the person has been, um, you still have some cleaning to do. But, but it, 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 it helps. Um, that process. But you still have to remember to click the clean word button too, right? That... Actually, behind the scenes, we do a little bit of that as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah, with us, we did the same thing. We, we use uh, uh, you know, a WYSIWYG editor that we incorporated into our product. And we, we, what we did was um, we made it customizable where you could make the paste and the, the shortcut for paste um, clean. It would be either paste clean or paste from Microsoft Word. And a funny story, one of our administrators made a custom toolbar for you know, everybody, including herself, where she may paste clean the only option. Mm -hmm. So that when you paste it, you're pasting clean, whether you, you know, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, if you're doing, you know, control C, control B, you're pasting clean. That's a good one. What's this contribute There's, um, when you are administering and contribute, you can control exactly what sort of, um, basically styles are inserted in. And as a Dreamweaver administrator, Dreamweaver has um, both Windows uh, cleanup scripts and front page cleanup scripts, which we find exceptionally helpful because we're moving from front page. And the cleanup doesn't always clean up enough, though. Yeah, I mean, I. Dreamweaver, it doesn't work very well. Yeah, and I've been looking for other things that will clean up something that's already. Um, already been done as well for that, but that's what we use. And then some of the stuff we just we have our some of our own scripts for some of the common stuff. Then we've got like wild cards that then we run ourselves as well. Well, we're, we're six or seven minutes over. Anybody else has a question they absolutely feel like they want to ask? We'll go ahead. I'm sure our speakers will be willing to stay, but otherwise. <laughs>